The advice and opinions expressed by Dr. Grant Pichet and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. Dr. Doreen Grand Pichet is the Dr. Doreen is an expert in autism. Doreen Grand Pichet. Dr. Grand Pichet. Dr. Doreen Grand Pichet. Dr. Doreen Grand Pichet is a visionary in the field of autism. Now you can ask her questions on Ask Dr. Doreen. Good morning and welcome to Ask Dr. Doreen. So excited to be here on this very special day with the wonderful Dr. Doreen Grandpiche. Good morning, Dr. Grandpiche. Good morning, Shannon. How are you? And you look beautiful. Oh, thank you. And so do you. And I'm, I'm loving your beach scenario there. Uh, we're so excited to have you long distance. We're live this morning. It is a very special day today because it is Chris Desmond's birthday and we are celebrating him all day long. If you guys don't know Chris, I'm so sorry that you don't know him better, but you do know him. He's a producer for our show and he has been such an amazing tour de force uh, to be added to our team and just a lovely human being and has brought so much with him. We are so grateful to have Chris with us. So we're saying happy birthday, Chris. Happy birthday. <laughs> Yay. That's lovely. Please feel What free. is he, 29 now, Shannon? Yes, he's 29 and, uh, and it's ex an exciting year for him. Uh, so uh, I don't know, I don't know which number 29, but he, he, 29. There we go. Uh, I just heard him chuckle in the control room. Uh, so please feel free to write in throughout the show and wish Chris happy birthday because it doesn't happen without Chris, my friends. Let's just be honest about that. If you love the shows you're seeing, you, you love Chris Desmond. Uh, so uh, thrilled that you guys are all here with us live. We've got a lot that we're going to accomplish today. Our overreaching topic today is going to be when do you stay the course and when do you make changes? And that can be about a lot of different things. And we've had questions about that, but we'll take questions about absolutely anything. If you guys, if it's your first time tuning in, we're here with Dr. Doreen Grand Pichet, I believe the preeminent expert in the field of autism. She is brilliant. I, I fondly refer to her as my mentor. Uh, love and respect and admire this amazing woman for all that she has done for her more than 40 years in the field of autism, helping families like mine to get to as much progress as meaningful and possible for our kiddos. Um, so much to say. But she's here. She's going to be answering your questions for the next hour live right here. We're live on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, all thanks to Chris Desmond. Uh, <laughs> And uh, you can write in live right now. Now, many of you are watching us uh, later on in the day because your lives don't allow you to watch live. We love that. We're so glad that you're here and having an opportunity to watch. Uh, for those of you that are watching us on our YouTube channel, we, we love that you can see us and hear us. That's a wonderful way to watch and to search topics. This is, we are in more than 14 years in, we're in the 14th year, so I don't know what that means, but we're in the 14th year of this show, so you can search topics from many, many years before. But many of you are listening to us on the go in podcasts, and we love those listeners as well. Please find us where whatever platform you like to use for podcasts, we are a free download to you. Please don't be mistaken. The show is not free at all to do, and it actually costs us money for you to download it. But we defray that cost with uh, some of the advertisers that you will hear on the podcast. We hope that you will embrace that. If you really prefer to have your podcast without the advertisements, you can absolutely do so by going to glow, G-L-O-W dot F-M slash Autism Live. When you do that, you get the the podcasts for Autism Live and Ask Dr. Doreen completely without advertisement. There's a low monthly cost. It's $5. When you pay monthly, uh, if you pay uh, for the entire year, you get it at a discounted price. So thrilled that you guys are here. We're starting out by saying hello to Rodney and to Daisy. Um, and uh, But I will say that we do not appreciate or accept if you are promoting something else or products that we have not vetted on our, um, uh, for questions. That is not allowed. Your comments will be deleted 
And if you persist, you will, you will be uninvited, which I hate to do. Don't do that. It's rude. Uh, so just putting that out to everybody. Um, but thrilled that, uh, well, apparently Rodney had a birthday yesterday. So, no, Rodney's having a birthday tomorrow. I can't do the math. Happy birthday, Rodney. Thrilled that you are here. So, Dr. Grampichet, the topic this morning was when do you stay the course and when do you make changes? I'm going to start with our first question, but you guys can be writing in right now. My daughter is in a school where I'm not always convinced that they are using her time well. There are mm -hmm. more, uh, they are more interested in shoving her into a program than actually educating her. She is 10 years old, and I have been fighting with the school district since she was three. They don't believe in one-to-one -one aids. I, this, mm -hmm. I, I have heard of other schools like this, but it makes me crazy. They have kept her in special ed with a smaller class and a teacher's aid. She's doing okay, but there's no real progress. Question. Should I stop fighting with them and just move to a district that will give her an aid and a chance at mainstream junior high and high school? Oh, junior high and high school are around the corner. I just don't know what to do. What a great question. Sending this parent a hug. Yeah. What do you want to say? I mean, it's just, yeah, Shannon, you always remind me that there are these situations out there with parents still fighting their school districts for what's best for their child, which is really upsetting. And, you know, we have enough going on that we shouldn't have to fight our district as well. Um, I don't know your daughter, so I can't comment on whether or not it's best for her to exit special ed. But in general, I think uh, a lot of our children who progress and are learning, uh, the goal is for them to learn more and more so that they can actually not be in special ed and they can go to lesser restrictive environments, for instance, regular ed with their own one-to-one. -one. So that is a goal for our kids as we uh, start programs of ABA because what we're doing is we're teaching our, our children at their own pace, um, on, focused on the things they need. And as they master those things, obviously they become eligible for regular education with their own aid. Now, if your school is not providing that to you, and it sounds like they're not, and your daughter is getting bored, not really gaining any kind of benefit from special ed. Um, if you don't have teachers or resource people there at that district who would be able and willing to really actually implement a decent IEP or individualized education plan for her, then yeah, your only other solution is to move and actually enter a district that is a little bit more collaborative and willing to personalize the education that your child needs. Yeah, it's tough um, because any, t and one of the things I think we'll discuss today is that when, the reason why we don't automatically move all the time when s things don't seem to be going well is because sometimes you have to start over and there's a loss of time and it's constantly, I know as a parent, you're weighing that. Well, if I pull them out of this, then I have to rebuild this and you don't know what you're jumping to, which is so hard. And yeah. a lot of times, I, I know I did this where I found myself uh, at school staying with a teacher in a situation that I knew wasn't working, but I was afraid of changing and how yeah. long was it going to take and how much time we were going to lose and I didn't know what we were jumping to. But I will say that, um, you know, there is a time and a space and, and if, if I agree with this parent that junior high and high school are coming. <clears throat> I would prefer it if this parent had a good IEP to move because you realize the new school district is going to take the IEP that you currently have and you're going to have to ask them for new testing. Um, to be, to be able to get them to change and add the aid. But it's gonna, I feel like it's gonna be worthwhile and I, I feel so bad for this parent because when you get in that mode where you're saying, uh, should I yeah. jump? Uh, it's, it's really hard on the guilt factor, Dr. Grampy-Shay. I know, I can imagine, and it's a lot of work too. Yes. But I mean, I think at any given time, if, if it's a 
district that is uh, collaborative, you can modify the IEP. Yes. You can go in there and say, the reason I want to move is because this other school was not actually doing what's appropriate for my daughter. Absolutely. And, and I love that you yeah. use that word because that's the killer word, appropriate. Yeah. Um, you have a right to that, the free, appropriate public education. Okay. Right. Um, <clears throat> now we're moving on to when is it the right time to leave your ABA provider? This person writes in and says, I love my BCBA. She totally gets me and my son. But for over a year, they have promised me more hours and we still don't have them. I have made my son totally available. He just turned four. I refuse school services to be available for ABA. And even though they know I want a 40-hour program, the most we are getting is, a tw is 20 hours a week. I feel my window closing and I don't know what to do. There are no guarantees about getting more hours from another company, and I may not like the new BCBA, but I also feel like I'm failing my child if I don't get him all of his hours. Please help. Yeah. What a, you know, wonderful situation. I mean, I would love to have those parents because yeah. they're not, you know, it's so important for a parent to say, I just want more hours. And um, I, I would suggest that you... Uh, especially if you have made your child available in the mornings. I w the one thing that might help, I don't know if other organizations do this, but I encourage parents, if you know someone who is interested in becoming a behavior technician, uh, does not have to have a psychology background uh, or ABA background, there's a lot of training. I mean, at CARD, for example, Shannon, as you know, we encourage parents to refer people to us uh, to go through our training. And when they do that, obviously it helps tremendously because we then actually promise that family that we would place, if it's, a fa if it's someone that's close to the family who referred, we'll put them on another case and actually give a therapist to the family. But essentially what I'm saying is, if you engage in trying to help find or recruit behavior technicians for that company that you're with, often it helps provide more hours to your child. Um, I do think the hours are important. Again, I don't know how old your child is, but if you they are really four. wanting more hours and they're not able to provide that to you, then it's time to maybe have a serious conversation with your BCBA and with a director and say, I'm going to have to move if I don't get the hours that I want. I'm willing to help. Uh, I've opened up my schedule. What can I do to get those hours? I love that answer, Dr. Grampiche, because I feel like this is a problem that's across the ABA yeah. services and that I think, you know, this parent says I'm worried about it because there are no guarantees of getting more hours from another company. And I think that yeah. that's absolutely true. And I... Yeah. And I love that she specified and said, I love my BCBA. That yeah. in and of itself, um, I don't think you should just lay down and, and do nothing, but I love the idea of going to them and saying, this is my priority. What can I do? Is it, yeah. Because sometimes we don't know that there's something that we're like, you know, and I, and I love that she specified that I've already, I've, I've said no to the school. I've made him available in the mornings. I love, love, yeah. love. But you know, there might be something that this parent can do to make it happen. But more than that, I find that it's important when you as a parent state what your priorities are to your ABA provider. I, I, I feel like because there are so many parents right now who aren't prioritizing ABA, which mm -hmm. makes me sad. I know that's not this audience, but um, there are people out there who are not that, that it's important that you do specify what your goals are, what you would like, and that you want more hours. Boy, those are the people we all want to work with, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, I know that if it was CARD, like we would really do everything we can, especially for parents who are opening their child's morning hours by keeping them out of school. We'd be all in. Yeah. And, yeah. and I have to say, I mean, it's been many, many years since my son was in therapy, but I remember we didn't have insurance back then. I had to fight for other funding. And I remember saying to my team, look, I'm fighting hard to get the funding for these hours. I, what can I do to make sure that we can staff the whole thing? 
And I remember feeling like, oh, they're going to hate me. They're going to dislike me. They're, and I've heard that from a parent recently. I don't want to rock the boat. I like them so much, I don't want to rock the boat. And I, I always say, you know, I was 100% convinced that on our last day of card that all the people at card were going to say, whew, we're so done with her. And instead, you offered me a job. Uh, <laughs> I mean, and it, it, well, you are an exceptional person, not yeah. just an exceptional parent, but and it was our our it was a, a blessing for us to have met you. But all of our parents, honestly, who are committed and want more for their children and want to be engaged and want to learn more and want to do more, uh, it's a joy to work with parents like that. It really is because. Unfortunately, as you said, Shannon, the world of ABA has changed a little bit and parents are less, uh, they're less, I guess, knowledgeable about the power of ABA. Um, you know, over the past, I think, five years or so, a lot of uh, the pushback from both payers and the education system and the way our BCBAs are trained and all of that it has ended up with people thinking ABA is something to do but not the thing to do yeah. and so it's not always prioritized it's not always given value and it's unfortunate because it can actually help our kids accomplish such a tremendous amount absolutely i i mean and in, in, certainly in my case it was life-changing okay now we're going to foray into the diet thing because somebody okay. wrote in and said when do you know a dietary intervention isn't working and it's Great. okay to switch back. I have pulled my son off of sugar and artificial colors and flavors. It's been about a month, and the truth is his behaviors have gotten worse. Can I safely let him have his treats now? What a great question. That is a wonderful question. Um, I want to answer it in two different ways. So with dietary restrictions, generally you can actually even look up and see like the length of time it takes to, uh, you know, see if your child is benefiting from, let's say, a gluten-free uh, diet. Uh, each each uh, allergen, I suppose I should call them, ha will have a different period of time where you'll see a reaction. So for instance, with gluten, it might take a couple of months if you're doing gluten-free type of diet because when you're when you will see the results after inflammation in the gut has gone down, so it takes a while. Uh, with casein, for instance, it will is probably faster. It's more like three weeks. Um, with things like sugar, you have to be careful because you are now. You're not, you haven't just reduced sugar from his diet, which means basically what you're doing is like teaching his body to metabolize better and not have sugar highs and lows. But what you, what it sounds like you've done is you've reduced his reinforcers. So that's a little bit of a, what I would say, a confound. In other words, he may be not doing so well because he's not getting treats um which are his reinforcers and that really doesn't have anything to do with like you know the other side of it is you might be doing a lot of good for his health by removing the sugar and the dyes but you're not getting positive behavior because you don't have reinforcers in his life so what i would really recommend is that you try to find other things that are sugar-free that are reinforcing for him that are, he really wants, put those heavily back into his life and then see if you have a healthier child who's also happy. Uh, because right now I wouldn't recommend going back to reintroducing sugary treats. That's basically just not good for any kid. Um, but especially for our kids who tend to be hyperactive sometimes, sugar and food colorings tend to increase that inattention and hyperactivity. So keeping him off of those things is good as long as you can reward him in other ways. And that's very important as well. I love doing this show with you because I, I always uh, like see things from a different point of view because I read that and I totally thought yeast die off. Sure, uh, sure. And that could possibly be as well, of course. Uh, so if a child has yeast issues, right, so fungal issues or candida, 
Um, you are absolutely right that sugar would be feeding the yeast, right? And so it, once you've removed the sugar, you could be experiencing yeast die off, uh, which would then result in worse behavior before it improves. So again, you shouldn't reintroduce sugar. You should definitely give it more time uh, for whatever reason it is, but make sure that you're giving your child some treats or reinforcers that are sugar-free. I love that. Love, love, love that. Uh, we could talk all day about yeast, but we had a parent write in with a pretty, it's a pretty long email and I'm going to um, edit it down. <laughs> so, okay. uh, but she has a wonderful, lovely daughter. Uh, they are in an area where they're kind of far from things. She is getting ABA, but they have to drive quite far to get to ABA. So they're only going three days a week. Um, mm -hmm. having it intensely on those days. And that's, it seems like that's the max that they can do right now. One of the yeah. behaviors that her daughter was engaging in was literally pulling out her hair. Um, okay. And that they were concerned that the, it was damaging the roots of their hair. She and her husband made the decision that what they would do is shave their daughter's head so that there was nothing to pull. And she says, we did not realize that that meant that the behavior would transfer to other things, which has led to her pinching and biting, especially her left arm. Um, and okay. that they've tried a lot of different things to deal with this, including uh, trying to restrain her. They have also gotten the, the sleeves that, are, um, that she can't bite through and mm -hmm. that she takes those off regularly. So that continues to be a problem. Although mom does report that on more than one occasion when her daughter has started to escalate and get upset that she has brought the sleeves to her mother for her mother to put them on, you know, ostensibly knowing that the behavior was coming. Um, she has a couple of different questions. In particular, this mom also is working in a public school with kids on the spectrum. So she's there with them all day and then comes home to her daughter. Um, she wants to know what you think about the decision to shave the head. She wants to know about restraints. She does describe uh, sometimes when her daughter is engaging in this behavior, sitting down on the floor with her kind of what she describes what I interpret as like a basket hold, trying to mm -hmm. hold on to her. But, you know, she and her husband are wondering if that is in fact the thing to do. She says she will wriggle and struggle out trying to bite the adult. Uh, she says we recognize the more restraint we put on her, the more we will have to fade. So we do not try to force our power and strength over her more than we have to. It's hard to put in words, but we try to block her behaviors more so than pinning her down. We've tried the arm guards, uh, which I mentioned, she does take them off, but that she has brought them to her. But typically she's just in too extreme of a mode to calm herself. This is a, a, a mom that uh, when skills was closed to new customers, she asked for an exception. We, mm -hmm. I pleaded that case, they granted it to her, but to, she's honest that she did not know how to use it. So she mm -hmm. wants to know, first of all, is skills currently available and is there the potential to get training? She says, I have not even looked at the site yet. She wants to know, how do you feel about cutting the daughter's hair? And how do you feel about how they're handling and engaging with the self-injurious behavior? Yeah. Definitely sending this mama hug. Yeah, lots going on here. Yeah. Um, so the unfortunate situation is that I can't give you a lot of feedback because I don't know what the function of the behavior was to begin with. So remember, when you see a behavior, you don't just jump to, uh, you know, I should, this is not a good behavior, so I should probably block it or restrain the individual or eliminate the source, which might be the hair. I don't know, you know, it ha you, you have to identify the function. In other words, why is this behavior occurring? What under what circumstances is, are these behaviors occurring? We can't even be sure that the hair pulling and the biting or pinching are the same function. So every behavior you need to be able to identify what under what circumstances it occurs. Uh, for example, it could be occurring 
because your child is frustrated from a demand that is being placed on them, in which case there are lots of things you do. You Yes, you would uh, block the behavior, but you would make the demand easier. You would help the child actually accomplish something. You would increase their reinforcers for complying with the demand. You would break down the demand scenario into smaller steps. Uh, it could also be that your child is doing these behaviors because of a sensory need, in which case you would replace with a more appropriate sensory type of stimulation. So all of those things come into play. And since we don't really know the function, uh, you know, you need a you need a behavior as a B BCBA to do what's called a functional behavior assessment to identify why these behaviors are occurring one behavior at a time, and then that will help identify what to do next. Um, skills is available to the public. There's a section on skills called BIP Builder, which is connected to an indirect functional assessment, which will ask you a bunch of questions about the behavior, and it might help you identify the function, and then it'll help you select um, what you should do treatments that you should do in the BIP behavior intervention plan for these behaviors. Um, I don't, I'm not a big proponent of restraints, particularly when it comes to self-injury. You know, self-injury usually is either sensory or uh, frustration, you know, kind of like avoidance of demand, but you never know what it could be. I would say that if you can see the only two feedback areas that I can give you is uh, if you can see the frustration escalating, uh, it, it might be helpful to do some calming activity before it gets to a heightened level. Um, there's lots of calming activities that our kids can do. Again, I don't know your child. I don't know their age. I don't know their functioning level, but we do teach a lot of kids to do breathing and counting, which helps them calm themselves down a little bit. Pressure often helps reduce the need for injury. So there's, you know, you can have squoosh balls or things that might be able to replace if it's a sensory need. Um, and then again, if it's a severe situation where your child is really bringing harm to themselves, you might want to talk to a physician as well and see if there are medications that could help alleviate perhaps the anxiety or you know, it could also be obsessive compulsive desire. Something is causing your child to feel uh, just very uncomfortable, very unhappy that they're doing this. And it's important to try to identify some of those functions. It's so important what you're saying. I, you know, the other day I was at one of our card offices and I was sharing my story with some of our staff and talking about before we made the decision to come to CARD and do ABA, we were given by the state of California a, a floor time uh, program. And I don't know if people are familiar with floor time, um, but it often gets sold to people as, oh, it's the kinder, gentler, which I cry <laughs> total BS on, um, that floor time was actually traumatic for my son. And, and the, the, the circumstance that I described was it was this wonderful little facility that we would go to and it was like a three hour in the morning thing and, and the kids would get there, they would be allowed to play a little bit. Then they would all go into this little music room and sit in the primary colored chairs and the kids, they would put on a tape and the kids would all sing the alphabet while signing it. Now he's in a group of like six, seven kids that are all, all have a autism diagnosis and some of them have dual diagnosis. And we would go, and the parents are all there too with their kiddos. We would go into the room and my son would do anything he could do to get out of that room. Yeah. He would cry, he would scream, he would kick, yeah. he would bite, he would hit, he would do anything. And I, as a parent, was like, I, you know, what's going on? And the advice that we were given was to put a weighted vest on him. Oh my gosh, yeah. I know. So we put the weighted vest on and then, you know, that didn't do anything. That didn't help him at all. It didn't slow him down at all as he would run to the door, be grabbing the door. If you had to pull him away, he'd be hitting, biting, kicking. I think it was just more. 
in fact. So then we had our weekly meeting and they were like, well, now we're going to try a five-point harness chair. So he's got the vest on and they put him in a five-point harness vest and what and they had me sit behind him and try to be like soothing his arms but what he would do is he would rock the harness he would rock the chair which was a little bit heavier but Uh. still you know he was a strong little kid he would rock the chair so it hit me in the chin and then he Uh. would turn it on its side and he was like a turtle with this thing on his back now crawling still trying to get out Oh my God! Right. So then I had a meeting, and then I had a meeting with them, and they said, "Well, let's put a weighted blanket over the five-point harness chair." And I said, and I was hysterical, and I said, "Why don't you just staple him, staple him to the floor?" And and the woman kind of paused, like she was considering it. I don't. And I said, "Why are we not figuring out what he's having the reaction to?" I didn't know ABA, but I was like, "Why? Why are we just trying to like?" you know, squish him down, why yeah. aren't we figuring out what the problem is? And as exactly. soon as we switched and came to ABA, you know, they were like, well, he's having sensory things that this is too much for him. And yeah. let's help him to mitigate that so that he can enjoy the enjoyable part of it while not being overwhelmed by the sensory part. It was yeah. so clear to me that ABA was interested in going, something is going on with this child. Yeah, Let's, the why. The and why, why is so important. <clears throat> and how can we help him instead of just trying to put something to squish him down? And I was so grateful that for the first time, somebody was interested in what was going on with him because something is going on with all of our kids. So I, I and I, I feel so bad for this parent because sometimes it's that, the, you know, the X on the FedEx truck, where all of a sudden you see it and go, oh my goodness, there's a reason why she's behaving this way. Please don't beat yourself up about what's come before, but I hope that if you have this ABA team, you will lean into them, go with what Dr. Grand Pichet has said and talk to them. So, and, and please, we didn't answer the first question. Skills is currently available um, and, and we can absolutely get some help for this parent to be able to use it. If nothing else, I will happily donate my time to show you how to use it. Um, yeah. I, I think I mean, they there want are, more than we, that. There are, there are people who can also demonstrate how to use skills, but I think the primary use for this parent would be the VIP builder because yeah. it really sounds like they need help figuring out the function of this particular behavior. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So please, um, I and that came to an email directly to me. I'll write back to her um, and, and let's get you started on the right path because bless your heart and your daughter. Priscilla has written in and said, Hi, my son is at Card O'Hare, Chicago. He just turned four. When mm-hmm. it's time to go to school, do you recommend public school for the support and social interaction or a private school K through 12 grades? which will be a one-to-one school full-time. This would be a great investment and sacrifice, but we want the best outcome for him. I'm just wondering what you would suggest. The school I'm considering is Brightmont Academy, Chicago. We will continue with ABA until we have to move on. My son was diagnosed with mild autism and ADHD. He is super bright and hyperlexic. I love you both. I do want to say that Brightmont Academy is... um, uh, that has schools in many different uh, places. We actually were talking with them at Autism Live about partnering with them because they have a very unique program that they do that's one to one. So I'm not, I'm not, I don't know how familiar you are with Brightmont, Dr. Grampiche, but um, I know a little bit about them because we were in talks with them about partnering. That's great. No, I don't know about them. It's and I guess your feedback would be very valuable here, Shannon, but my general feeling is it depends, my answer depends on on the level of the child. So ultimately, I mean, first of all, thank you for uh, entrusting us with your child. Uh, four years old, wonderful. I love it when a parent is at four saying, is high functioning and we're looking at schools and this is great. So. I guess the the one thing I want to think, so with one-to-one, you're going to have, I guess, um, 
<laughs> there's two sides to every coin. So one-to-one -one provides more access to, I guess, the things that might be pertinent to your child. And so therefore it'll be very focused on the things that your child needs. Obviously it's gonna be a higher quality because it is one-to-one. -one. Um, on the other hand, your child gets used to learning from one-to-one -one only. And I don't know how long Brightmont goes or, you know, what the future holds, but there's something to be said for teaching our kids to learn in a group environment because that's real life. And perhaps Brightmont might take him through elementary, but at some point he's going to have to learn in a traditional way, which is in a classroom with teachers. Um, that said, you really need to evaluate your, the the quality of your public school and whether it's a, a an environment where he will flourish and thrive and learn. So there's a lot that goes into it, Shannon. You know, and, and it's hard to give one answer or another. I would just perhaps if uh, I would ask my BCBA to go and observe the options, and that might be able to help. I love that idea. I have to say, um, we have something in Los Angeles that is kind of similar to the Brightmont model that is just down the street from us here, Dr. Grampy Shea, the Fusion Program. Yes, um, yes. And for, I, it was some, something that I definitely toured and considered for GEM. And I think it's really individual for different people. First of all, a lot of times we see that the population that really utilizes that sort of format are, are kids that are Olympic athletes, kids mm -hmm. that um, are actors, for instance, yeah. that they need to go to school and they want to make sure they get a good education, but they can't go in the confines of the times. I love that for Brightmont that they are very able and willing to work around the time schedule for ABA, for instance, that if That's you are really still good, trying yeah. to do an intensive ABA program and school is saying, well, you have to be here and ABA says that's when we have a therapist, Brightmont is, is great for that because they're going to be able to work around your schedule. And what they do in these programs is that they maximize it's very ABA-esque in that they're saying, okay, so what you're trying to learn right now is math. All we're going to do right now is teach you math one-to-one -one on your schedule so that you're able to get the most from it. And then when we want you to socialize, we're going to have you in, in a group. So, that, so they do have opportunities for you to do things in a group, but when we're teaching academics, they focus on that one-to-one -one and make it very individualized, which means that the kids often move significantly faster, that you can accomplish so much more academically in a short, shorter period of time because you're not dealing with all the other kids' behavior and all the other kids' stuff and how, you know, and moving faster like, or slow. It's like homeschooling. Right? Yes. It's like, yeah. But with like incredible experts. They have incredible experts. So I absolutely love that about this kind of model, which is why we were talking about partnering with Brightmont. It's really expensive. We, we have to be honest about this, but one of the things that I do love about Brightmont is that they have a program to, that they help uh, parents very successfully to be able to get that money from the school district. So, um, That's awesome. yeah, so I, I, I don't have anything bad to say about, um, about Brightmont. I, I really kind of loved their model, um, and I think it's definitely something to be looked at. Not everyone needs that model. Um, mm -hmm. As you were saying, it's so individualized and... Well, how high up does it go, Shannon? Does K it go through 12. That's great. K through 12. And That's great. For, for some of our teenagers who have such extreme anxiety when they're in a classroom and having to deal with this, I don't know how anybody deals with the social circumstances of junior high and high school right yeah. now. I'll be honest yeah. with you. It's a mess yeah. post-COVID. It's a mess for those kids. I would definitely recommend at least doing this for a period of time, uh, yeah. whether you have to do the whole junior high, high school, um, you know. Well, I mean, there is, I if they do go through 12, they it's do. not a bad idea to actually just go with the model, right? Because uh, I think one of the things that I see with kids who've been homeschooled, for example, is yeah. that going later in life, entering a social situation with other kids is hard. Yep. So um, I I like the idea that it provides flexibility, especially if it's a child who's with card, 
because as you know, Shannon, we are able to do so much more with our kids in the morning. Yep. And if if the program allows the child to receive their academics in the afternoon, then even better. Yep. And if it's a family, you know, it is definitely going to be much more individualized and higher quality. Um, so I can't really think of a negative situation to go with it as long as they're they and us, we all plan social activities for the child as well. Yes, absolutely. And I do want to say, because I know you guys are going to start writing in, um, Brightmont is in many different places around the country. And when I was last talking to them, they still, it's, it's brick and mortar and the child typically comes to be face to face with the teacher. Although they did have a model for tutoring that if you just want tutoring and um, that does not have to be face to face. And I was talking to them about the potential to be able to do it distance. I don't know where they are with that right now. So um, just putting that out there to our friends over for our friends over at Brightmont, uh, not meaning to be a commercial, but I was impressed with what they had. Uh, oh. Susie has written in and says, is there a training class for skills? I had the same problem. I was completely lost in skills and would love to purchase it again. This breaks my heart um, because I love skills more than anybody else. Um, and all, I'm always happy to help with a parent Happy to set up an appointment with you and walk you through things. I think they have better people than me who know more about skills currently, but I'm always happy to spend time with a parent working on that. Um, I think, Jen, and, the, and, and there are people at skills, by the way, who do demos, but I don't, and they will show you the different areas of skills, but it's always a little bit different when you uh, get a demo from a, a parent or a clinician who is a frequent user. Yeah. Uh, than the person who's on the sales team at Skills, you know? <laughs> so there's a different level of that. But Susie, we, we're always happy to help people get back into the use of Skills. And I'll, I'll announce that I'm making a lot of changes to Skills in the coming year. So hopefully make it a lot better too. Yes, very excited about that. Esther, bless Esther's heart. Esther has written in and said, my four and a half year old with ASD is this week starting to have a hard time adjusting to his new one month old brother. He is whining and imitating the baby's crying, wants to use a bottle, wants to be picked up, is cranky, etc. How do we deal with this? He is not usually like this. He is a happy, fun boy, but lately he is tantruming and whining and thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, it's clearly he's trying to gain attention. So I think the way that you deal with it is that you um, preempt his attempts to get attention by giving him his own time. And this is very hard. It's easier said than done, I know. But if there could be a period of time that is very specifically scheduled during the day multiple times, could be short periods of times, but, you know, 30 minutes at this hour, 30 minutes at that hour where it is solely his time and you are able to hand the baby off to someone else or maybe the baby's sleeping and you very specifically do things with the, your other child, uh, fun things, activities that are giving him a lot of reinforcer and, and attention. And, and then when he fusses, Maybe you can have a visual schedule or just show him that, oh, our together time is coming up and then ignore the fussing. Because I think a lot of our kids who have a younger sibling, uh, they, they're they anxious because they're, they're having now to learn to share attention. So I think spending one-on-one -on -one time with him is very good. In the long run, as things get better and as the other child gets a little bit older, you could also start to do activities with the two children. But right now, I think it's all about just focusing on him and giving him his own time. Yeah. One of the best things I think, well, there's so many great things that CARD taught us, but that at different milestones in our son's life, and we never you know, uh, spoiler alert, we didn't have a second child, so I never had to deal with this. And bless you, Esther. But, That's hard. but at each time that, you know, I remember when Jem turned four and when he turned five, they encouraged me to make a big deal about, okay, now the rules are different. Or, mm -hmm. you know, now you're a kindergartner. Now you're a five-year-old. Now you get yeah. to do this. Now you get to do that. And I've seen people very successfully do that with the big brother thing. 
Well, now that you're a big brother, you get to do this. Or we're yeah. going to get to do this that we never yeah. got to do before because you're a big brother. And making yeah, it like, awesome. you know, I, I love to watch when you say something to kids and they kind of, they stand up a little taller and they preen and they're like, oh, look at me. Like the thing that they get when they realize that they can toilet themselves and they're like, you know, yeah. look, look at me, I'm sparkly. To really sell that big brother thing. But I always think, yeah. I, my sister had three kids at nine months apart. She had a son and then she had twins. I guess it was 10 months later. So, you know, all of a sudden she had these three little kids. And I loved that my parents started when the kids were just babies, where every weekend they would take a different kid and say, it's your weekend. Because they yeah. recognized that these three kids were never going to feel like an only child. Yeah. Um, and, and that weekend was all about that kid. Where do you want to eat breakfast? What, do, what, you know, what park do you want to go to? What, what fun thing are we doing with you? Because it's your weekend. And, and I don't, I, I don't think my parents ever got enough credit for the fact that that helped my sister immensely, of but course, it also helped all three of those kids that still talk about, oh, I remember when it was my, my weekend with grandma yeah, and Paga, they sure. called him Paga. Yeah, and I love the idea of saying you have special privileges now that you're a bigger brother, big brother. Uh, make sure that the child understands what that means, big brother. In other words, your privilege is just because of this baby existing, right? And one privilege could be staying up later after the baby's asleep. And again, that would be a good opportunity to do one-on-one -on -one time. Amazing. Uh, Ajaitha has written in and said, hi both. Firstly, thank you very much for the wonderful work. My son is five and a half years old, goes to kindergarten at public school, can speak four to five word sentences. Do you think he needs B12 shots? That was not where uh, I thought that question was going, but that's where it was. I, I was shocked by that, yeah. <clears throat> so, I mean, okay. So I generally, that to answer the question about B12, you should probably have a physician uh, do a blood test and see if there's a deficiency or if there's other uh, reasons why they suggest B12, like lack of energy or something like that. But in terms of having four to five word sentences, that's awesome. And I think he needs ABA. I don't know if you're doing ABA, but four to five word phrases is a really solid foundation um, on which you can build quite extensive language. So I don't know that, you know, a lot of parents will like say, oh, I need my child to like, I, I need something to jumpstart my child. Let's put it that way. And I don't think you are there. I think your, your child has a good start. You just need to build on it, if that makes sense, Jenna. I want to ask a follow-up question. I want to ask what makes you think that they might need the B12? Yeah, I think I've had a lot of parents tell me that a physician told them that if your child doesn't have language, uh, a B12 shot might start. So maybe that's what it is. I will be honest that I'm the person who dragged my feet horribly on the B12 thing. Like I just didn't want to do it. And it was yeah. like, I, and I, you know, I think you know this about me. I'm just like, I, I have to like, you know, really have a moment and think hard before I take a Tylenol. I'm just not a medication person. Um, yeah, and, and giving your child shots <clears throat> is a whole nother thing. And it's too. red. It, it comes yeah. in the tubes and it's red. And I'm sorry, but that's a part of it that I was like, I can't yeah. inject something red into my child's tuchus. Um, I just didn't want to do it. And people were describing, well, here's the other part of it. People were describing that they were rubbing a little bit of lidocaine on their kids' butts before they were doing it while they were asleep. And I was like, okay, I'm horribly allergic to lidocaine, so I can't be anywhere near lidocaine. So that freaked me out. And I hated the idea of while my child was sleeping, injecting him with something I yeah. just couldn't do it, right? For so many reasons. And especially yeah. Lisa Ackerman, every time I would see her, she'd be like, why are you dragging your feet? It's, you know, so many people say that it's so great. But when we finally did start the B12s, I will be honest that our son was speaking at that point, but the issue for, and the thing that it changed for us 
is that sometimes my son would come to me and he would say something and there was no context. Mm -hmm. And I would always be trying to figure out what are we talking about right now? No context was, and we were working on it, but we were struggling with it. And, yeah. and the first week after he started the B12s, um, and he could say four to five word sentences to me, but I wouldn't always understand it. He, ca he came and woke me up about a week after the B12 shots and he said, mm -hmm. mom, yeah. remember when we went to Disneyland mm -hmm. and we went to the Blue Sky bu Building and they showed us how they built Cars Land? And I was like, yes. I'm like sitting up in bed going, Yes. And he goes, and remember how we watched that Disney movie about the pigeons in World War II in London? Yes. And he said, I think that they should build London at Disneyland and show us at Blue Sky how they built it. That's insane. And I like stood up on the bed and said, Jim, wake up. <laughs> Something's <laughs> going on. Because, because before the B12 shots, that would have been him saying blue sky pigeons. Yeah, there were the pigeons, yeah. blue sky, London, and I wouldn't know what the blue sky was, which was the building right. at Disneyland. He would have been yeah. giving me all the pieces. That's what B12 did for us. I don't know that it does that for yeah. everybody because I think well, it's different. Yeah, so let's talk about what B12 is. And yeah. we're actually talking about methyl B12. Yes. And it's important because it gives you a, a clue as to what it's doing. It is improving your methylation cycle. And your methylation cycle has to do with your ability to redox, which is detoxify from toxins. So if you have a child who is a little bit like sluggish or not able to clear their mind maybe, and a, a, as you described with Jem, maybe not able to put things together and in, in more of a, you know, needs some aspect of clarity, which is due to toxicity. And usually this is children who are like more allergic to foods or more reactive and so on. It makes perfect sense in your case, Shannon. Um, then, then yeah, methyl B12 is going to jumpstart that cycle. But it's not always going to be that way because there are children where the issue is not a methylation issue specifically. Yes. yes, absolutely. But thank you for saying the methylation because that makes a big difference. Um, yeah. That yeah. there are B12 shots that are not methyl B12 shots. Yeah, it's cyanocobalamin versus methylcobalamin. Yeah. And, and you also can do the methyl B12 sublingually. Um, mm -hmm. It is not as powerful um, but I know I take a methyl B12 under the tongue every day now. Um, mm -hmm. and I find that it makes a big difference for me, but I, you know, I, everybody's methylation cycle. I don't want to. It, it makes a huge, I, for me, I mean, and not just methyl, but cobalamin in general, like, um, B12, like if I take a supplement, like a vitamin that has cyanocobalamin in it, even any kind of B12, I'm it, and if I get a shot, even way more, like my energy level is so high that I can't sleep that night. Wow. So it really makes a big difference for different people. And so, yeah, I really recommend that we don't just try it because we think there's some improvement that we're going to see in behavior, but we start with looking at where are the blood levels and, and what needs to be adjusted. Absolutely. And we should also mention that there are side effects, like you were saying, that for you, that it makes you so awake that you can't sleep. For a yep. lot of our kids, the methyl B12 shot um, will cause um, a sensation of itching around the mouth and yeah. even chewing on things. That yeah, it gives you a weird taste in your mouth as well. It, make, it feels like you have metal in your mouth. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I know we had to get uh, jewelry for Jem because otherwise he was chewing on his hand and his shirt and his pencil. There you go. Um, so we had to get, you know, the, the necklace and send a note to school saying he's going to be chewing on the necklace and you need to let him. Um, so, Amazing. So you do need to, like, take all those things into consideration. Uh, Susie wants to know, how old was my son when you started the methyl B12? I think he was six or seven. I waited a really long time um, because 
And I encourage you, uh, I, I love some of the stuff that they have over at TACA. Um, you can go to tacanow.org. Um, and I also encourage you, if you can get uh, one of their free mentors, um, that's a really oh, yeah. good uh, thing to do so that you've got another parent who's been through it who can help you to go through all of it. Um, because there's so much to know. And I do encourage going to TACA conferences. I love usually at the TACA conferences, there's somebody who has, uh, I don't know if they had it the last time I was there, but they have the little, uh, <laughs> they, they look like cutlets, you know, the things that women put in their bras to sort of beef up. Oh, sure. Uh, it looks like yeah. that. And they, they have them laid out and they have little shots that you can go over and they help you to practice the angle of, oh, right, of right. how to get the methyl B12 in. Uh, that you're practicing on the little cutlets so that you're not practicing on your kids took us because who wants to practice on their kids took us not me that was really honestly the hardest part and I will say that I did not do the thing where he was asleep although most parents do I wanted I you know I know it's an overused word but you know I wanted the ascent I wanted him to know that we were doing it and that yeah. it was something that was good for him because that was me um, and I will say that we did like a year of the shots and then he said, I would like to stop this. And we said, absolutely. And then a year went by and he came back to me and he said, mom, I can't, my words are there and I can't access them. Can we go back on the shots? And we did. Um, and then he told us when he was done. So that's amazing. it, well, but that's him. And that is, I always like to give the, you know, the disclaimer that my kid is not your kid and your kid is not my kid. And, um, but you know, we take into consideration the individuality of that. Um, so hopefully that helps look at all these people who have, have come at the last, um, I love that, uh, autism journey with Elijah made it. Helen is here. Uh, and Amanda made it. You guys missed the beginning. We said it's Chris Desmond's birthday. Please tell Chris Desmond happy birthday because this would not happen without him. Uh, Julie is here too. And Julie says, is skills developing only up to and for a particular age? Is a 15-year-old to skip developing and go straight to skills living? Yeah. Great question. Um, I think you can skip. It depends on what your focus is. We develop, We wrote skills developing um, and it was intended to be from mental age eight up to mental age eight, but that doesn't mean that a 15 year old can't be using it because obviously there are areas where some of our 15 year olds are still functioning below the eight year level, right? So if your child needs the skills that are in skills developing, go that path. Uh, you can use both, honestly, because there are other areas of focus other lessons in skills living and can i just say one thing i always uh when i first started reading through all the lessons in skills i was like oh i don't know how to do that uh mm -hmm. there were things that i didn't know how to, and i'm talking about skills developing that yeah and the asterisk that i was always told was that it's for up to mental age but it's skills that are emerging at eight doesn't mean yeah, that you yeah. at eight you have it completely figured out, um, right. but things that you you know are starting to emerge at eight. But I also love skills living and all the because it just oh, I do too. Yeah. adds so much more for the kinds of things that there are things that you're going to have to deal with it as a fifteen year old that you're not going to have to deal with as an eight year old. Um, oh, absolutely, and there's so much more focus on. Uh, teaching things that are useful to you at that age. Yes. So yeah, I mean, I would take a look at both curricula and and uh, you can always use both even. Yeah, there you go. So skillsforautism.com. I always say to everybody, and I laugh when I say it, but it's not all that funny. Uh, tell them that we sent you. Tell them that Dr. Doreen and Shannon sent you and ask for the friends and family discount. Uh, I don't know what that will mean right now, but you know, it doesn't hurt to ask. Um, and if you are struggling with it, um, please tell them, but please drop me an email and let me know. Um, cause I'm happy to do like a webinar next week and be like, here, here are the basics of how to use skills and just invite yeah, people that. to come on to it. Uh, Shannon at autism live.com. Happy to do that. 
Um, and Shannon, if you do that, let's please record it. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, happy, happy to do that. Uh, I just would need to know, like, if there are people that want to do that. Um, but I'm always happy to jump on a call, too, and, um, and say, you know, look, here's, here's, here's the skinny. Because I, I love skills as, as much or more as anybody. I always say it's their biggest fan. Uh, last thing, uh, can we comment on digestive enzymes, how, they, how would they help? Yeah, yes. Uh, digestive enzymes are very, very helpful. They help us to produce all the different types of enzymes that we're not necessarily producing because our food source is not very good these days. So yeah, if your child has bloating or constipation, diarrhea, other GI types of issues, uh, obviously leaky gut, uh, digestive enzymes can be useful. Again, this is one of those things where you should best discuss it with a uh, a physician, preferably functional medicine physician, or a nutritionist or experienced dietitian. There we go. There we go. Okay, wonderful. We're out of time. I did want to say thank you to Dr. Grant Pichet uh, for being here always and, and telling us uh, all the wonderful things that you tell us, man. You change the world every day. And thank you, Shannon. I don't think thank I say it so enough, much. but I adore you. And Thank you. Also, love you, and I love Chris, and I'm so always happy to do this show with you guys. Well, we love it. Tomorrow's show, I just want to tease that we are having Dr. Megan Anna Neff with us to discuss her new book, Self-Care for Autistic People, 100 Plus Ways to Recharge, De-Stress, and Unmask. This is Ooh. both for you know teens and adults on the spectrum, but also for the caregivers who love them to help them to learn self-care skills so that they can take care of themselves. I'm very excited about talking about it because you know self-care is the thing that I'm always saying we need to do, but I can't figure out how to do it. So <laughs> I'm excited <laughs> about this book. Uh, Dr. Neff will be with us tomorrow to discuss that. And oddly enough, our jargon of the day will be adaptive skills. So we're in sync with what we're talking about. That will be tomorrow morning on Autism Live. Please don't miss that, you guys. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you too. Bye-bye for now. Bye, everyone. Don't forget, you can watch Ask Dr. Doreen live every Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. Pacific time. We hope to see you there.